Welcome, everyone. Glad to see you here. On behalf of the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University, I am delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture featuring Professor David A. Hollinger in talking about American missionaries and the struggle for control of Christianity's symbolic capital. We're very glad to see you here. My name is David Golding. I'm a historian in the Church History Department. We begin events like these at Temple Square with the word of prayer, and I have asked Jessica Nelson, a volume editor for the Joseph Smith Papers, to give that prayer. I will then introduce our speaker. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful to be gathered here this evening here at the Church History Museum to hear from Professor Hollinger. We're so very grateful for the resources and time and energy that have made this conference possible. We pray, Father, for the collaborative efforts that will be made uh, throughout this conference and that um, scholarship and uh, further opportunities for collaboration will grow out of this. Father, we are so very grateful for the blessings that we enjoy here, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Here in the United States, perhaps the most recognizable image of the Latter-day Saint movement is that of the clean-cut, young, cheerful, door-knocking, bike-riding missionary. The church sponsoring these missionaries maintains an enterprise of recruiting, training, and dispatching young adults, retirees, and other volunteers unlike any other institution in the world. Regular Latter-day Saints sustain a missionary movement out of proportion from their population. A core of missionaries representing something on the order of 15% of the worldwide Christian missionary force. Missions touch virtually every congregation of the church, and yet the scholarship on this ubiquitous dimension of the Latter-day Saint experience has thoroughly tended toward addressing the proselytizing concerns of the faith, or addressing Latter-day Saint audiences alone. We here tonight are party to some important developments on this front. The church is sponsoring a gathering of accomplished scholars to research and discuss the missionary interests of Latter-day Saints and Protestants. We hope to bring some synthesis to these large and hitherto disparate bodies of historical scholarship. Tonight's lecture, is the public keynote launching this effort. We are delighted to have several other symposium fellows who will be meeting tomorrow to continue these explorations. I can think of no better historian to help bridge these fields of scholarship and inaugurate our new collaborations than our speaker this evening. We are honored to have with us Professor David A. Hollinger, a scholar of rare skill whose career has been field-changing, impressively broad and integrative and original. David Hollinger is the Preston Hotchkiss Professor of American History Emeritus at the University of California at Berkeley. His achievements and accolades are numerous and resist brief summary. He serves on the advisory board of the Obama Presidency Oral History Project at Columbia University and has chaired the Academic Freedom Committee for the American Association of University Professors. On two separate occasions, he was an elected member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and has served as trustee of both the Institute for Advanced Study and the National Humanities Center. Professor Hollinger has served as the president of the Organization of American Historians and is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has taught at the University of Michigan, the State University of New York at Buffalo, and the University of Oxford. His accomplishments extend beyond his home discipline of history into the humanities and social sciences. He has delivered plenary addresses at the American Political Science Association and the American Psychological Association. We could easily spend the hour merely sampling from Professor Hollinger's illustrious register of publications. Although this feels painfully truncated, 
I'll highlight his recent critically acclaimed books. Although he is the author, most recently, of When This Mask of Flesh is Broken, a narrative that blends memoir, family history, and religious history, and deploys Hollinger's expertise in the history of ideas in service of his own story. In 2017, he published Protestants Abroad, a study celebrated by one eminent scholar as providing the best and most comprehensive account of how missionaries and missionary-related individuals went on to influence a diverse segment of American society. The literary establishment, the founders of academic departments and area studies, artists producing blockbuster musicals and cinema, non-governmental organization administrators, members of the Foreign Service Establishment, and leaders in the civil rights movement all are represented in this book. This monumental work on Protestant missionaries offers a deeply researched narrative of how American liberal Protestants came to question their own identity and purpose after encountering the rest of the world. His book, After Cloven Tongues of Fire, published in 2013, met with wide acclaim among historians of American religion, and his post-ethnic America received a 10th anniversary edition, becoming one of the most influential scholarly works in American intellectual history. Taking some of his ideas in Protestants Abroad a bit further, Professor Hollinger tonight will say more about the effects of missionary engagement on support groups at home. After his remarks, we will have a few moments for questions from the audience, so please keep track of any questions that may come to mind. Will you now please join me in welcoming Dr. David Hollinger. I'm glad to be here for all sorts of reasons. Uh, two of them, <clears throat> uh, when I was growing up in Idaho and Washington in the 1940s and early 50s, uh, my parents were among the many, many non-Mormons in the United States that would listen every Sunday morning to KSL and uh, the spoken word by Richard Evans coming from the crossroads of the West. I can still remember the <laughs> idiom with which <clears throat> this was announced. And then, of course, there was music, too, as well as <clears throat> the spoken word by Richard Evans. So I'm very glad to be back here for sentimental reasons. <clears throat> the second reason that matters a lot to me is that um, <clears throat> when I was doing this book, Protestants Abroad, uh, which is about how the foreign missionary experience affected the United States. How is it, you know, people go to India or Africa or wherever and they come back to the United States, their children come back and they're affected by this in some way. And as I was wor working on this book, um, I became interested <clears throat> in how the Mormon missionary experience uh, was similar to or different from the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists and so forth. And of course I was aware um, that there's that the uh, Mormon missions are generally just for a shorter period of time, whereas a lot of the people I was working on, uh, you know, even not only a whole lifetime, but generations. So there were obvious structural differences. But what was frustrating to me is as I looked around for literature on it, and I wrote to, oh, a number of people. I wrote to uh, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich and Jan Ships and Dick Bushman and a lot of people to try to get advice on, well, where is the monographic literature? on the impact of the foreign experience on the Mormons themselves. Do they come back changed by the experience of spending all this time in Indonesia or Brazil, or do they not? And there's a little bit of a literature, but not much on it. So I was really delighted <clears throat> when the folks here at the historical office of the LDS Church and their colleagues at BYU <clears throat> said that they were interested in this question and welcomed my collegial collaboration and cooperation to try to get uh, more scholarship going uh, in, in, in that area. So although I'm not gonna be talking much about Mormons uh, tonight, I am gonna try to outline some of the context in which Mormon studies can develop. But I will start out <clears throat> with a reference to the Mormons. <clears throat> when the Sao Paulo businessman, Ulysses Suarez, was added to the Quorum of Twelve a year and a half ago, the Church of Latter-day Saints brought the Global South into its own governance structure in a highly visible fashion. Yet the LDS governance structure, like that of the Roman Catholic Church, <clears throat> enables populations of the North Atlantic West 
to continue to maintain traditional control to a very large extent. Not so with many of the major Protestant groups whose governance arrangements give much more power to rank and file members throughout the denomination beyond, as well as within the United States. <clears throat> American Methodists, eager to recognize same-sex marriage, are outvoted by Methodist delegates from Africa and Latin America. The Anglican Communion has witnessed an African bishop perform a rite of exorcism on a British gay priest in the shadows of Westminster Abbey. A majority of the Seventh-day Adventists in the United States <clears throat> have been trying for decades to ordain women but since only 10% of the 18 million members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church live in the United States, the American Adventists are outvoted every time by biblical literalists from the global south who repeatedly invoke 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35, which says unequivocally, unequivocally, <clears throat> that women are to remain silent in the churches, that is a disgrace for a woman to speak in a church, and if she has a question, let her ask her husband. Now, these differences in ecclesiastical rules <clears throat> mean that some confessions, like the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the Adventists, confront more directly than do the Mormons, the Catholics, and quite a few of the mainstream Protestant groups the challenge presented to Christianity by the dramatic increase in the numbers of professing Christians in the global south. But even when constitutional arrangements <clears throat> do not enable affiliates abroad to determine policies for American churches, the growth of the global south Christianity plays importantly into the long-term rivalry in the United States between ecumenical liberal constructions of the faith and evangelical conservative constructions of it. This rivalry is most visible <clears throat> between large families of institutions, the ecumenical so-called mainline churches associated with the National Council of Churches and the Christian Century on the one hand. On the other, the more conservative churches associated with the National Association of Evangelicals and Christianity Today but the ecumenical evangelical divide is also present within a number of the classically mainline confessions. And as the case of the Adventists can remind us, this rivalry is found also within the classically evangelical churches too. Now a Presbyterian minister <clears throat> in Salt Lake City who said she had just returned from a walk in the park with the Apostle Paul would be referred to counseling. The same might happen even to a small town Alabama pastor of a four square gospel congregation, but not necessarily to a Pentecostal minister in Uganda. Dreams like Daniel's <clears throat> are no longer confined to a distant Mediterranean antiquity, but are testified to in churches of the present day. African bishops espouse doctrines <clears throat> long since regarded as anachronistic and obscurantist by most educated European and American divines, yet still defended by some American evangelicals who welcome new allies. The more that Christianity <clears throat> comes to be defined by the American evangelicals who have found a champion in Donald Trump, the more marginal becomes the standard issue liberal Protestantism for which Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and Pete Buttigieg are poster children. And the more on the defensive become the small group of beleaguered evangelical leaders who struggle against Trump. Control of the symbolic capital of Christianity is at stake. The increase of Christian numbers in the global south <clears throat> and the decline of Christian numbers in the North Atlantic West is a world historical event, the significance of which is only beginning to be seriously debated. A missionary project involving the sending churches of the historically Christian North Atlantic West and the receiving populations of the rest of the world has been largely replaced by an ostensibly undifferentiated global Christianity. <clears throat> 
This decentering of the historical heartland of Christianity was driven by the increased agency <clears throat> of the indigenous populations of the receiving countries, who eventually and loudly declared that they were no less Christian than their missionary teachers. This decentering was also driven by the diminution of imperialist and colonialist attitudes on the part of the sending churches, many of whom worked hard to de-westernize Christianity. This decentering was further affected by the relative secularization of the global north, as the numbers <clears throat> of churchgoers and the cultural authority of religion declined in Britain, the Netherlands, the Scandinavian countries, Canada, and the United States. The upsurge of Christianity in what used to be called the third world became all the more striking. Observers began to speak of a seismic shift, <clears throat> a seismic shift according to which the old faith migrated southward. This evening, I want to address some of the apparent dynamics in that world historical event, calling attention to a vast and multifaceted process to which the Church of Latter-day Saints is a relative latecomer, but in which LDS is an increasingly important participant and given its size and huge international range may play a very creative role in the future of global Christianity. A good place to start <clears throat> is with the career of the American Methodist E. Stanley Jones, hailed by Time magazine in the 1930s as the world's greatest missionary. Year after year following his arrival in India in 1907, Jones found that the experience of living with Hindus was changing him. He decided that the culture of his American upbringing was hopelessly provincial. Spending a lot of time with Hindus led Jones to conclude that the American Protestants were more of an obstacle to genuine Christianity than was Hinduism. He celebrated Gandhi as Christ-like. He operated an ecumenical ashram. Jones condemned <clears throat> the ancient class system of India, but our white, cast, our white caste idea in America is worse, he said, because it is opposed to our Christian faith. Jesus, declared Jones, with great passion, was colorblind, but American Christianity is decidedly not. Jones's years in India made him take seriously the radical universalism of Galatians 3.28 to the effect that in Christ there was no Jew nor Gentile, no slave nor free, so forth. Imploring his American co-religionists to give ground to the East, <clears throat> Jones sketched a vision of India as the bride of Christ. We of the West must trust India with Christ and trust Christ with India. Jones developed this pluralistic view of the world and of the Christian faith itself in dozens of books, the most important of which was The Christ of the Indian Road, first published in 1925. This book reads remarkably like the multiculturalist manifestos of the 1990s. I participated in the multiculturalist debates of that decade and after, and was struck <clears throat> with how the curricular reforms of schools, the pronouncements of college diversity officers, and the manifestos of progressive pundits followed the precise logic and structure of the liberal Protestant missionary theorists of half a century before. Jones endorsed the world's cultural diversity and insisted <clears throat> that Christ traveled many roads quite different from those on which Americans had made their own spiritual journeys. Jones was a flaming cultural pluralist, eager to recognize and appreciate the vast variety of human societies, their customs and beliefs. We want the East to keep its soul, he said. <clears throat> he wanted the Indians and the Chinese and the Africans everywhere to be discouraged from copying the ways of life that Americans assume to be Christian. Many of Jones's contemporaries resisted this outlook as too liberal, as insufficiently affirmative about the superiority of the Christ of the American road. The gospel has complexities <clears throat> that new converts in Brazil and Congo and China cannot be expected to grasp right away. We Americans and Europeans need to retain leadership, but even defenders of the traditional view reluctant to embrace distant tribes into the body of Christ unsupervised, understood that Jones had hit on crucially important issues. The Christ of the Indian Road sold 400,000 copies in its first four years, and in that brief time was translated into 14 languages. 
Jones <clears throat> was but one of many missionaries of the 1920s and 1930s who reported that their experience in the field had changed them, changed their views of the Christian faith, changed their view of the missionary project, changed their view of other religions, changed their views of the United States. Frank Laubach, a congregational missionary to the Philippines, preached that the future of Christianity was Asian and that the peoples of Asia, <clears throat> as they became Christian, would transform the faith into something truly able to speak to the entire human species. Books, journal articles, lectures while on furlough, reports to missionary boards and denominational officials conveyed a steady stream of demands for reassessment coming especially from the mission fields of India, China, Japan, and what was then called the Near East. Now, several of us here at this conference <clears throat> have written about the liberalization of many of the missionaries, but the historical profession as a whole has not yet registered the extent to which some of the missionaries of the 1920s and 1930s were just as sensitive to the character and interest of indigenous peoples as were Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict. And no doubt, just as blind in some ways, the notion that missionaries are always racist and imperialists, while anthropologists are not, dies hard. <clears throat> the missionaries were right there with the legendary anthropologists in attacking the racism, the ethnocentrism, and the imperialism of their times. By the 1920s, the American Protestant foreign missionary endeavor was more than a century old. Missionaries had long reported being enlarged by their experience in the field, <clears throat> but never before the 1920s had there been such an outpouring of this testimony, and never before had a critical edge been remotely as prominent in accessible magazines and other public forums. The missionaries who were sent abroad after about 1900 by the major Protestant groups, by which I mean the Presbyterians, the Congregationalists, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the Dutch Reformed, the Disciples of Christ, and the Northern Baptists, these missionaries had been differently educated than those who had served in the 1830s or 1870s or even the 1880s. The seminaries <clears throat> and colleges that prepared the new generation of missionaries taught them about what were just then beginning to be called the world's great religions. The superiority of Christianity was not called into question, but a basic familiarity with the beliefs and practices of Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims had come to be expected of the new recruits. This prior knowledge, <clears throat> which was based extensively on the experience of the earlier missionaries, many of whom wrote impressively learned works, equipped the new generation of missionaries to more quickly view with sympathy and understanding the beliefs and practices of indigenous peoples. What made for change then was not simply the impact of alterity. That impact differed depending on the frame of mind and feeling the Western missionaries brought to their experience abroad. A second kind of knowledge contributed to this liberalized frame, and it came from philologists and archaeologists based largely in the universities of Europe and the United States. <clears throat> the seminaries and colleges of the turn of the 20th century provided a more deeply historical understanding of the scriptures than had been the norm in earlier generations. Many early 20th century missionaries had learned that the book of Isaiah had been written by two or three different authors many centuries apart, and that many of Paul's letters uh, were not even written by Paul. These modern missionaries and the leaders of their support groups at home were also dealing with the insistence of the biblical scholars that many of the prescriptions of the New Testament were designed for a world that was expected to end very soon, perhaps within Paul's own lifetime. The instructions of Jesus and Paul were simply not designed for a situation in which Christians would be building institutions and communities that were designed for the long haul. Elizabeth Clark's most recent book reminds us of what a difficult challenge this was. <clears throat> for find, for the, when the biblical scholars announced this, it was very hard on the Christians who had assumed that the Bible was designed to speak directly to them at their own time and place. So even the truest of faiths had been created by real people in real time, and even the choice of what ancient documents should be included in the canon was made by other real people in real time under specific historical conditions amid honest and deep conflicts within the early Christian community. This recognition of the historicity of Christianity 
made the educated missionaries <clears throat> sensitive to the historical circumstances of the indigenous peoples they dealt with on a daily basis, instead of the stark pagan-Christian dichotomy, the more liberal missionaries came to see the religions of the world as stages of spiritual growth. God had shared some of his power with other faiths. Christians had more divinity, but it was a mistake to deny the spiritual substance and integrity of the world's other faiths. Both of these elements of historical knowledge, higher criticism and an appreciation for <clears throat> world religions, played into the fundamentalist modernist dispute for which the 1920s and 30s are now remembered. Fundamentalists wanted no part of the higher criticism and disparaged as a distraction <clears throat> the empathic study of non-Christian religions. While the fundamentalist modernist dispute usually is depicted in our textbooks as focused on evolution, actually missions were the big deal. There were plenty of fundamentalist missionaries schooled most often in a variety of Bible institutes, <clears throat> not Princeton, Yale, Harvard, and Union. And as Joel Carpenter has pointed out, the gap in education between the two groups was enormous. The two groups of Protestants fought each other in the various mission fields, especially in China. Some of the leading modernists like John Layton Stewart, the president of Missionary Connected Yangshan University and later US ambassador to China, were tried for heresy during the ferocious conflicts of the 1920s and 1930s. <clears throat> Quite a few of the missionaries who began to speak in ecumenical voices were driven out of conservative churches, gravitating mostly to the Congregationalists and the Episcopalians. As these quarrels proceeded, a persistent point of tension between the two groups was how much respect should be offered to indigenous populations, whether they had converted to Christianity or not. If the locals had converted, the question usually took form as to how much authority should be yielded to the new Christians. The fundamentalists repeatedly accused their modernist rivals of turning over too much responsibility and ecclesiastical power to the Chinese, the Japanese, the Bengalis, the Tamils, the Turkish, the Arabs, and so forth. If the locals had not converted to Christianity, <clears throat> the question usually took form as to how much deference should be shown to people who remain committed to pagan religions. The fundamentalists were adamant that preaching and conversion should remain the center of the missionary project, while their opponents <clears throat> moved towards social service and what they call teaching by example, exemplifying the Christian life rather than preaching that without it, a soul was bound for hell. The schools, hospitals, and public health projects of the ecumenical missionaries were generally designed to help entire indigenous populations, including non-believers. These mission-focused conflicts of the 1920s and 30s did much to institutionalize the ecumenical evangelical divide that has largely defined American Protestant history from World War II all the way to the present. On the ecumenical side, <clears throat> often still called mainline, there was the well-educated leadership of those classic denominations and the prestigious old seminaries like Union, Chicago, Yale, Pacific School of Religion, on the evangelical side of the Great Divide, there's Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, Liberty University, Biola, Wheaton, the Southern Baptists, the Assemblies of God, the Nazarenes, and the Adventists. This divide has many sources in economy, class, and culture, and it would not do to ascribe the depth and durability of this divide <clears throat> exclusively to the ways in which the experience of foreign peoples affected American Protestants but that experience did play a significant role. Time after time, when the ecumenicals took another step to renounce what they thought were paternalistic, imperialist, colonialist, and racist features of the missionary project, the evangelical leadership rose up in horror and affirmed the traditional ideology of missions and accused the liberals of substituting politics for faith. During the 1940s, for example, <clears throat> ecumenical missionary Edwin D. Soper published The Philosophy of the Christian World Mission, a comprehensive theoretical treatise advocating greater empathic identification with indigenous peoples and an appreciation for the styles of Christianity being developed by converts all over the world. <clears throat> 
Evangelical theorist Harold Linzel replied with a volume of his own, a Christian philosophy of missions, declaring that only an inerrant Bible could be the basis for salvation and that missionaries were abandoning the faith if they pulled away from that emphasis. Linzel described his work as a final theology of missions, insisting that his ideas were true for all time, were not simply uh, uh, an adaptation. Uh, nothing had changed, nothing ever would, so long as Christians were true to their faith. Christianity was not a historical entity. This was just a mistake. Christianity was a divine, transcendent entity with an eternal structure. Now, the ecumenists of the 1950s and 60s <clears throat> were at great pains to respond to the self-declared interests of indigenous peoples and to treat every church in Nigeria or Mexico or China or India as the full equal of churches in Boston or Boise or Buffalo or Bloomington. Manifesto after manifesto of those decades proclaimed that every community in the North Atlantic West was no less a target for missionary work than were the most primitive or remote sections of Angola or Thailand. The very idea of sending and receiving was, in this liberal view, a mistake. The historically mainline churches cut back their foreign missionary projects so that a greater and greater percentage of the total American missionary project was evangelicals and continued to prioritize preaching. Evangelical missionaries in the field sometimes described the ecumenical World Council of Churches as a greater obstacle to Christian progress than the pagan religions of Africa. In 1966, <clears throat> nearly a thousand evangelical leaders gathered at Wheaton College to fight the insidious ecumenical menace and declared resoundingly that the gospel of salvation through Christ should be unashamedly preached to every human being and not put aside in favor of social service endeavors. During these late 1960s years, while the ecumenical churches were increasingly opposed to the Vietnam War, evangelical institutions, by and large, supported that war, which, as David Swartz has shown, the missionary leadership of Fuller Theological Seminary characterized as a welcome opportunity to spread the Protestant gospel in historically Catholic and Buddhist Indochina. The two largest and most important conclaves <clears throat> of the late 1960s and early 70s perpetuated this pattern. The World Council of Churches meeting at Uppsala in 1968 was one. The Billy Graham organized evangelical conclave at Lausanne, Switzerland in 1974 was the second. The Christian century celebrated the Swedish meeting as the historical moment when the service impulse has been finally liberated from the project of making the world Christian and when Protestants were finally and fully authorized to use whatever means they could to serve the poor, the defenseless, the abused, and the forgotten. Many quotes of Matthew 25, 35 at that point. Uppsala recognized that the problem to be addressed, <clears throat> the centuries correspondent asserted, is no longer pagans in remote areas, but corporate managers in the West who erode human dignity and deny power to anyone that they can control. The traditional role of missions, insisted one prominent commentator, was now advanced by a host of secular agencies, including, in many cases, business enterprise. The evangelicals castigated all this, but gradually and grudgingly, <clears throat> gradually and grudgingly gave ground on the issue of service. In 1974 at Lausanne, the largest evangelical missionary meeting ever held, the official line changed to accept and indeed to affirm service projects as relevant to the spread of the gospel. Although the Lausanne conferees did not admit it, their speeches followed closely the speeches liberals made 50 years earlier about the connection of service to the gospel. The Lausanne meeting held the line against heretical theological ideas and against any kind of partnership with non-Christian religions. <clears throat> Harold Linzel was again one of the main evangelical voices, railing against his favorite enemy, the World Council of Churches. The ecumenists of the WCC forget, complained Linzel, crucial truths. There is a hell, and anyone who dies without having personally made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ is eternally damned. By the 1970s, more of the evangelical missionaries <clears throat> were better educated than previously, and in the field often behaved more like the ecumenical missionaries. As the most recent scholarship shows, 
some of the evangelical missionaries experienced the same kind of deprovincialization experienced by the ecumenical missionaries in previous generations. But the overwhelming majority of the evangelical intelligentsia supporting and training the missionaries, as Grant Wacker has pointed out, still resisted the sympathetic study of world religions enacted with great sophistication in the liberal seminaries. This evangelical intelligentsia, as Molly Wortham has shown, was highly intellectual about issues they cared about, such as spiritual inerrancy, but they were slow to condemn the blatant anti-intellectualism of Billy Graham's mantra that the Bible says what it means and means what it says. By the 1980s, <clears throat> there became visible gradually a, my, a major irony there became visible a major irony in the American Foreign Missionary Project. The ecumenicals, who were originally the most eager to recognize the self-declared interest in feelings and priorities of indigenous peoples, found that the indigenous peoples who converted to Christianity gravitated toward the style of Christianity advanced by their evangelical rivals. The simple salvation narrative pushed by the evangelical missionaries turned out to win many more souls than the Christian life exemplified mode of religious witness favored by the ecumenicals. Aspects of scripture <clears throat> downplayed by the ecumenicals had real resonance. Speaking in tongues and other apparently direct experiences of the Holy Spirit proved very appealing in many African, Asian, and Latin American communities. This owed much to local circumstances and cultural traditions, as Philip Jenkins, Brian Stanley, Richard Elphick, Robert Freckenberg, and others have established. Jenkins correctly observes that in the eyes of some poor and persecuted peoples, the book of Revelation looks not like a weird book, but like a true prophecy on an epic scale. The notion of one's dictatorial government being an antichrist Jenkins continues, is not a bizarre religious fantasy, but a convincing piece of political analysis. The American evangelical missionaries <clears throat> found that their emphasis on the evils of homosexuality played very well in many indigenous communities. Parts of the gospel that the ecumenists had found relatively unimportant caught on among even many of the converts the ecumenicals had made. The legacy of the ecumenical Protestant missionary project in the developing world was enormous, especially in education, medicine, and public health. But much of that legacy appeared in secular institutions in Thailand and India and Nigeria and China and so on, while the ecumenicals were losing control of the churches in those countries. This paralleled what happened to the ecumenicals in the United States. Their chief legacies took form outside the churches as Christian Smith and Martin Marty and a number of other scholars like to say, the ecumenicals won the United States but lost the church. But this had massive consequences for the control of the symbolic capital of Christianity. And the American evangelicals soon figured out that Global South Christians could be used as weapons. See, most of the Christians in the world are closer to us, the evangelicals, than to you the liberals. Lots of liberals <clears throat> wondered just how they should react when they watched a video of a Kenyan bishop blessing Sarah Palin in her own Assembly of God Church in 2008, praying that the vice presidential candidate would be kept safe from witches. Millions of Americans and European Christians wondered just how inclusive their own religion had become. Some wondered if their own discomfort with this might be racist. Now, not all the Christians in the Global South presented these challenges. Throughout the tr transition to which I refer and right down to the present day, various American <clears throat> liberal Protestants as well as evangelicals do experience fulfilling visits to affiliated congregations in South Africa and Ecuador and Sri Lanka. But there's no question, as Melanie McAllister has established, that evangelicals are more comfortable with more of the Global South's Christianity than are their liberal counterparts. World Christianity as a whole looks more conservative, more ostensibly orthodox, when the Christians of the Global South are counted as part of the faith for which American evangelicals claim to be the most legitimate voice. But how big a deal is world Christianity? Isn't, <clears throat> isn't Christianity in decline? Are we not experiencing massive 
secularization? Not at all, say critics of the secularization narrative. The religiosity of the global south has come to the rescue of those who resist the secularization narrative of modern history. Many popular and scholarly voices now insist that we now live in a post-secular age. There's a good bit of confident laughter at the secularization theorists of half a century ago. Attractive, <clears throat> as is the new talk of a post-secular age, there are empirical and conceptual problems with the use of the global south to refute classic secularization theory. The social location for the appeal of supernaturalist ideas and practices has actually continued to be exactly where predicted. According to those theorists of half a century ago, building on Max Weber, traditional belief in supernatural authority and deference to institutions claiming to speak for that authority are most likely to diminish when four historic conditions have come into existence. One, literacy and scientific knowledge are widespread. Two, physical insecurity has been sharply reduced by technology and military peace. Three, democratic pol inst political institutions have empowered a larger segment of the citizenry. And four, populations have moved from homogeneous rural communities to diverse urban environments. Only the last of these conditions is remotely common in the flourishing Christian communities of the global south. Moreover, within the United States, <clears throat> Pentecostalism most flourishes where some of these conditions, notably a high level of education, do not exist either. And the percentage of non-believers is the highest among the populations most highly educated in science and in the liberal arts. The use of the global south to refute classic secularization theory simply fails the most elementary tests of history and social science. But if the questions about secularization are easily answered, questions about how the remaining Christians of the global north are connected or not connected to those of the global south are more complicated. Are all individuals and groups who profess to be Christian really part of the same faith? And who decides? And for what purposes? The great missiologist <clears throat> Andrew Walls is one of many who insist that Christianity is still the same entity but has simply experienced this seismic shift to the South. But even Brian Stanley, another leading popularizer of the notion of seismic shift, raises haltingly and tentatively on the last page of his last huge book, the very last page, he raises the question, has Christianity conquered indigenous religions or have indigenous religions conquered Christianity? Stanley's uncertainty about the direction of causation, where is Christianity its own agent, and where might it have been subverted by foreign agents, is inspired largely by what he sees in the global south. Stanley here echoes a long-standing concern in missionary discourse about syncretism, the mixing of religious traditions. <clears throat> when does the mixing get to the point that what matters about Christianity is buried in the mix? Now, internal diversity and disputes over authenticity are not new to Christianity, well beyond uh, disputes about syncretism. Catholics and many kinds of Protestants have challenged each other's claim to be true Christians. Are Mormons really Christians? And so on. Persons claiming the banner of orthodoxy have often alleged that their liberal allies, excuse me, uh, persons claiming the banner of orthodoxy have often alleged that their liberal enemies have been taken over by secularism that Enlightenment influences have pushed aside what makes Christianity Christian. This was the standard complaint of fundamentalists against modernists. Stanley, who describes himself as a British evangelical, speaks in that tradition, positing a true Christianity that is at risk <clears throat> of being corrupted by other influences. True Christianity. What's that? It is exactly at this point in the discourse that the concept of the third church has come to play a vital role. This concept keeps the potentially dangerous appearances of the Holy Spirit at a certain distance while retaining them to enlarge the size of contemporary Christianity. There is Catholicism and there is Protestantism, says Philip Jenkins and a number of other scholars. These are the first two churches, both variations on the Christian project. And then there is the third church, 
which is Christianity in the global south. The concept of the third church <clears throat> allows one to have it both ways. The discomforting aspects of global south Christianity are countered as fully Christian for statistical purposes, but not part of either the Protestant or Catholic churches, even if formally affiliated. The concept of the third church functions somewhat like the two-thirds clause of the original federal constitution, which enabled white Southerners to claim the slave population for governance purposes while not freeing the black people and not welcoming them into their own society. Some groups today <clears throat> do bring the Nigerians and the Indonesians into full juridical authority, as we have seen, but the great strategic value of the concept of the third church for American Christians who do not subject themselves to rules voted on by Global South Christians is that these American Christians are still able to claim the numbers of the Global South Christians when measuring the size of Christianity and when ostensibly refuting secularization theory and when declaring that Christianity's center of gra theological gravity is conservative rather than liberal. Like the two-thirds clause, one can claim, but one can get credit for their numbers, but can keep them at a certain distance from ourselves. But scholars need not be bound <clears throat> by the constructions of Christianity offered by Christians, conservative or liberal. Scholars report above all to an epistemic rather than a religious community. We can address the varieties and dynamics of the Christian project in the same way we address racism, socialism, Puritanism, fascism, romanticism, imperialism, Islamic fundamentalism, liberalism, a variety of other movements and persuasions. Scholars are free to develop their own sense of what defines a project and what its borders are. We don't have to be bound by the self-definitions of individuals and groups. Donald Trump may deny he is a racist, but scholars are not obliged to take his word for it. The Reverend Paula White, according to this morning's Washington Post, declares that Trump is a Christian, but he's a quiet Christian, unlike those loud Christians, the Clintons. She actually, she actually said this. You think I'm making this up? She actually said this. <clears throat> so who has the authority, who has the authority to deny that Trump is a Christian if his, if his evangelical enablers insist that he is. Scholars understand <clears throat> that insofar as Christianity is a single project at all, it is a prodigious one with many particular varieties, all of which necessarily overlap with other projects and draw on other historical matrices. When does Christianity define something? And when is Christianity simply a rider on the back of something else? The separation of the Christian movement from Judaism was not a quick and easy thing for the men who brought it about. Every episode in what we call Christian history is a result as well as a cause, a vehicle as well as an engine, a consequence of prior influences, no less than a force in its own right. In that respect, the witchcraft engaging Christianities of the global south are rather like the Jewish foundations of Jesus' ministry, part of the matrix out of which some particular new thing emerges. Consider the Masawi Apostolic Church <clears throat> of Zimbabwe. <clears throat> this church declares that there is no reason to study the Bible other than to learn from it how people can access the Holy Spirit themselves. What analytic purchase do we get <clears throat> on these people by saying of them that they're Christians, some perhaps, but surely not much. When scholars assess the size and reach of the Christian project, might they decide to assign relatively little weight to the Masawi church? What might such decisions do to the statistical counts of Christians in the world? The struggle for the control of the symbolic capital of Christianity is real. The most obvious stakeholders are persons who profess Christianity, but there's more to it. Christianity is such a large part of the United States, as we see in its current role in the politics of Donald Trump, that all Americans have a stake in what Christianity is and just who controls it. It is a struggle worth watching, both for people inside the community of faith and those outside it. That concludes my remarks. I'll respond as best I can. <clears throat>
if there are questions or comments, observations. <laughs>